With tensions heating up between the United States and China, questions are being asked about the future of US global dominance, with China seen as the rising power to dethrone Uncle Sam. Peter Zion, a political strategist, sees this picture very differently, arguing that China lacks many qualities to overtake the United States of America. Contrary to popular opinion, Peter Zion insists that the Chinese system is facing collapse and in this video, we will look at Peter Zion's views on the future of China to see why China as a country will not last this decade. I hope you enjoy this video and without further ado, you're watching all things humanities. This was always going to be the last decade of the People's Republic of China. Let's talk about the third most important reason why. We are having government collapse. Chairman Xi has instituted a per cult of personality far tighter than any world leader in history, including Mao, including the Chinese emperors of old, including Donald Trump. Okay, that was funny too. <laughs> He has intimidated into silence or imprisoned or executed everyone within not just the CCP, but the broader system who is capable of independent thought. He no longer has advisors. No one wants to bring him information because they don't know how he's going to react. He has literally shot the messenger so many times that he is making decisions in the dark. Now, this has horrible implications for any economic system. But in a one-man show, it means nothing gets done unless the leader gives you a written order or you're one of the zealots who sees him on TV and is like, oh, this must be what he meant. So when you see a small army of bureaucrats in head-to-toe um, surgical stuff out on a runway at an airport with a leaf blower spraying lime to disinfect the runway, that's the kind of policies we're getting out of China now. And of course, COVID, 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 COVID. Now, we're in the Midwest. I'm going to guess that there is a diversity of opinions in the room about COVID. <laughs> Some of us would probably side with vaccines where others of us think that natural immunity is the way to go. And I think in the privacy of our own homes, when the door is closed and no one's listening, we do think to ourselves, you know, maybe the other side has a point. Okay, is that safe? China doesn't have these options, and it's not because of government. China was very successful for two years at keeping COVID out. No one has natural immunity. And the Chinese domestically generated vaccine doesn't work. Barely worked against the wild strain out of Wuhan, but then we had Alpha and Delta and Omicron and Omicron B and Omicron Threat Confucius 7 or wherever we are. It doesn't work at all versus the new stuff. And Omicron B, the one that is dominant in China and dominant here today, it's the most communicable virus pathogen that humans have ever struggled with. And the death rate from it is higher than any of the previous strains. And for us, this is a footnote because we all have multiple sources of resistance now, but the Chinese have none. And if they opened, you'd be looking at 5 million deaths in China a month for at least a quarter, minimum. So they can't. Lockdowns are their only policy tool. Shanghai went into lockdown on April 1. They came out on June 1. They nearly went into lockdown again last week. It's a little touch and go right now. We're all familiar with Vegas, right? What happens in Vegas totally leaves Vegas if it's a venereal disease. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> China right now is struggling with an outbreak in Macau, which is their Vegas. So you should be expecting major metropolitan lockdowns across the country within a month. This is China's new normal. They can no longer participate in manufacturing supply chains because they can't keep the factories open. They are prioritizing health. That comes at a cost. Now, they're going to be losing access to Russian crude because of the war. They're losing access to manufacturing and employment because of their health policy. And we're having government failure as a managerial issue. All that really leaves is food security. Now, we all know that they love their pork. And we all 
remember African swine fever from three years ago when they had to cull more hogs than the rest of the world has hogs commercially. Now they've started to get back in. Well, they've done more than start. They've offered a series of subsidies at the federal and the local levels in order to encourage hog farmers to re-enter the market, but they forgot to abrogate the debts of the hog farmers that went out of business because of ASF. So you've got two million dudes like me taking subsidies who have no idea what to do with a pig. And so they're buying food from everywhere in the world, even if it's not appropriate for hogs. So obviously they're going for soy and corn, but they're like getting broken rice out of India and like croissant grade wheat out of France to feed to pigs. Like the least efficient way to do it. And again, two million people who have no idea what they're doing. Now, according to Chinese statistics, there has been no ASF in the country for months. <laughs> she gets it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You look at a heat map of where the cases are in East Asia, and like all the borders are like red. <laughs> but in China, it's eh, everything's fine. Uh, they're probably in the midst of a fairly significant outbreak again. The question is how far and how loud does it get before they have to do another absolutely top to bottom mass culling. Whether that happens this year or next year, I don't know, because Chinese data, eh. but we know it's coming. And if they don't have pork, all they've got left is rice. Rice is the most phosphate input intensive, in, uh, phosphate, in, bleh, bleh, bleh. phosphate is the crop that needs the most. <laughs> rice is the crop that is most phosphate intensive. Wow, that took like four tries. Uh, and so the, the Chinese have traditionally been the world's largest producer and exporter of phosphate because it's a food security issue. Well, they've stopped all exports until further notice. So we've lost potash because of the Ukraine war. We've lost phosphate because of Chinese mismanagement. Let's talk oil. This is total investment from all state and all private into all oil and all natural gas globally. And back in 2014, a narrative took hold in the financial centers of the world that fossil fuels were done. By 2030, we're gonna be off of them. And since it takes three to eight years to bring a field online, and another five to 15 years to break even, why in the world would you put your hard-earned money into a fossil fuel project when you will never get it back? Now, there's a lot of things about that line of reasoning that are wrong in my opinion, but it took hold. And over the next several years, total investment into the space dropped by two thirds. So lesson number one from that, it takes three to eight years to bring a new field online. If we triple investment today, we don't get back to 2019 prices until 2025, if we start today. Now that's what's true for the whole, the average. That doesn't necessarily hold true for each individual circumstance. This is by far my favorite graphic series. I like to call this the checkbook map because every dot is someone who can pay their power bill. That's where the world's oil and gas comes from. This is in one picture, a lot of the angst of the last 70 years. It's just, it isn't convenient to where we live and getting it from A to B, that's part of the, part of the angst of the global system. Now watch North America watch Saudi Arabia, here's where the shale is. There's 20 odd things about American shale that are fundamentally different compared to conventional energy. I think this is the most important one, at least for the moment. For us, only for us, we produce it where we live. And yeah, 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 the Texans are gonna bitch about having to get it across state lines, but it's not like you're going to central Siberia. This is easy, this is a good problem. Also, it doesn't take three to 10 years to bring on a shale field. It takes three to eight weeks. Now, that was back in 2019 before we had the everything in shortage economy. Now it's more like three to eight months, but still order of magnitude better, but not for anyone else. This is where the oil flows. The thicker the line, the more tankers are on that route. This is the route that matters the most. It is a convenient six to 7,000 mile sail from the Persian Gulf to the Chinese coast. Now we've all heard those stories about the Chinese having this massive Navy over 600 ships versus our 290. However, 
90% of the Chinese fleet would fit in this auditorium. Not all at the same time, don't be a dumbass. <laughs> One at a time. They don't have range. If, it, if no one's shooting at them, so they can go slow and in a straight line to conserve fuel, they can go a thousand miles, maybe. Most of them you're talking under 400 under a war scenario, whereas our fleet is entirely blue water. So if there is a real conflict in which the Chinese are involved, someone who does not care for them, and that is a long list these days, is going to put two destroyers in the Indian Ocean Basin and cut the energy line, and China deindustrializes within a year. And there you have it. This is why China won't last the decade. Do you agree with Peter Zion? Let me know in the comment sections below. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, consider pressing that like button and subscribing.